Don't get me wrong, church is great. We need church. Hebrews 10 tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We should be in church. We need community. This is when we come together. This is when we build each other up. This is when we sharpen each other and we encourage each other to go out and not forget and not, not do it again until we get back together next Sunday. But to get prepared to walk into every day of our life, fired up, wanting more. Church should be the appetizer for your week. It should not be your main course. Church should be your appetizer for your week. It should not be your main course. Welcome to the Intertwined Life Podcast. I am your host, Jenny Zentz. I am a wife and a mom on a mission. I've got a passion to help women discover practical ways to apply the power of God's word to our everyday stuff. I truly believe that our walks with the Lord should be seamlessly intertwined with our everyday lives. It should affect every move we make and every breath we take. So come on, let's do life together. You've got this, cause he's got you. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 43 of the Intertwined Life Podcast. I'm really glad you're here. I hope you enjoy today. It is actually a recording of a message I was privileged to get to give uh, just a couple months ago, maybe less than that, at my church at Rock Harbor Church, Florida. Link to the website of the church is in the show notes. Check it out if you want. If you are in the Melbourne, Florida area and you're looking for a home church, check us out. If you are not, but you're looking for an online place during these crazy times, we'd still love to have you join us. I hope you will enjoy this message, be inspired by it, and the power that can be found in the secret life of a follower of Jesus. Come on, David, dance for the Lord, guys. Wake up a little bit. Come on. I know we've already been here a while, but it's okay. We can have fun. Thank you. We're here. Our God has already won. Every victory is already ours. Are we excited? Yeah. yeah? Come on. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Woo! Let's wake up. Let's wake up. All right. I promise I'm going to do my best not to talk too long. You promise to stay awake, and I promise not to let you get bored. How's that? Can we make a deal? Okay. So a few years ago, several years ago, actually, before we even moved here, probably about seven, eight years ago, the kids were two and five. We're having dinner. I'm not going to say which child it would be. That can be your guess if you know my children. We're sitting at the table and one of them, oh, mommy, I'm so full. I'm so full. Meanwhile, there's like half a plate of veggies sitting on the plate, right? I'm so full. I can't eat another bite, mommy. Well, okay. Okay. You know, the starving children in Africa are not going to benefit from my child eating more than they need. So, okay. Right. And then five minutes later, I'm cleaning up the kitchen. Mommy, I need ice cream. Same kid. Mommy, I need ice cream. I said, but you just told me you were full. Oh, mommy, my veggie pipe is full, but my dessert pipe is empty. (laughs) Two years old, this kid was. Oh my gosh, right? So smart. That might have given away which kid it was if you were paying attention. Um, So incredible. But my question for you this morning is, do you feel like your life is so full that you are maxed out? You're at capacity, but you're walking around with an empty God pipe. That is something that can only be filled up in your personal, private, one-on-one time with the Lord. The theme verse that Pastor Kevin's been using this whole time is John 127. And I wanted to use a little bit different version. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the reason I wanted to use behold is because we've been saying look. And that's true. He's like, look over there. But this isn't like when you're at a restaurant and you're like, hey, look at that person over there. No, no, don't look. Don't let them see you. No, he's saying, behold, look, stare, notice, take it in, study him. This is the son of God who takes away the sins of the world. Don't glance his way. Behold him. This is a whole nother thing, guys. We could have called this series staring at Jesus, but that might have been a little weird. So we'll just stick with walking with Jesus. But that's what we're talking about, okay? This type of looking is best done on your own, in private, in secret, okay? We are calling this morning's message the secret life of the believer. This morning, we're looking at Matthew 6, and I'm not going to completely reread every verse, but we're going to kind of go through that a little bit. Jesus is beginning to introduce a more personal relationship with the Almighty God. Until now, people knew of Jesus, or they knew of God, but they didn't really know God. And so if you're taking notes in your bulletin, that might be an underline, I'm not sure. But they knew of God, didn't really, really know God. 
Because back then, it was the really religious leaders, the Pharisees, the holy, holy people who stood on the street corners blowing trumpets and pouting because they were hungry when they were fasting. These are the people who supposedly had the walk with God. And for the most part, just kind of did a lot of rules and rituals and had to keep a lot of things in order. But it wasn't really personal and really close to them at this point because the Holy Spirit had not yet come to dwell in the hearts as he does today in every single person who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. He hadn't come yet, so they didn't have that. They had some examples of people like David in the Psalms. They knew there were people upon which the Holy Spirit of God had come mightily. But they themselves, for the most part, hadn't really experienced that lovey-dovey feeling with their Heavenly Father. They just didn't have that walk yet. So Jesus is setting up a precedent for us here. For everyday people to understand that you can walk right into a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with your Heavenly Father. And that you could even refer to him as Father. Abba, I meant Daddy. He's taking him from God, which he still totally is. But he's saying, you know what? You can curl up in your daddy's lap and spend time with him. This was a mind-blowing concept, okay? This was not a very familiar concept. It was unheard of, and to many of the religious leaders of the day, this would have been considered blasphemy. So here's Jesus sitting here. We're in Matthew chapter 6. I used the uh, Amplified Bible, and there's a lot of words in the Amplified Bible because it does exactly what it says. It amplifies everything. So it's going to take the scripture, add a few more words to give us a bigger under... I do feel like the room's doing this. Give us a bigger understanding of what's going on and what he was really trying to say in the original language. So stick with me. I think you're going to actually see some things maybe you've never seen before. But when you look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and again, I'm just going to run through this. He says, when you do good deeds, don't try to be seen and noticed by everybody else. Don't be out there trying to get the credit for it, because if that's what you're after, that's all you're going to get. He says in three and four, he says, when you give, don't make a really big deal about it. Don't be sure you draw attention to your generosity so that everybody sees how kind and generous you are. Do it in secret, and your father, who sees what you do in secret, will reward you in the open. In five through 13, we love this part. We call this the Lord's Prayer. He says, when you pray... <laughs> Don't clear your throat <clears throat> and then go into the King James Version. Thou heavenly fatherest, holy art thou. Come on. We know people who do that, right? Come on. Everybody, ha, 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 laugh. That was funny. That was a joke. Okay. Wake up. Do it again if you have to play the music. So he's saying, you know, don't, don't get so stiff all of a sudden and make it all so eloquent that you don't even know what you're saying, but you're trying to impress everybody else around you with how holy you are. This is Jesus, the Son of God, God himself. And he's saying, we don't have to put on this show. We can come to our Father. So he's saying, see, he knows. When we pray, we can get alone with God. Go into the secret place and open our heart to him. Because he who sees in secret rewards in the open. And he says, keep it simple. God already knows what you need. He knows what you need before you ask. Don't go on and on to hear yourself talk. Then Jesus gives this example of the Lord's Prayer. Now, to a lot of us who did learn this in the King James Version, many of us who grew up in the church, that's the way we learned this scripture. It sounds um, very, very super spiritual. And while it is holy and it is sacred, these words that he used at that time for those people, it's very straightforward. It's very to the point. It's very basic. Give us what we need. Help us not sin. Help us forgive those who sin against us. Thank you and amen. You know, he praises God, he asks for what he needs, and he praises God, and he closes it out. And so he's saying, you know, oftentimes people will pray out of obligation, they'll pray this prayer out of obligation or out of habit. And he, we were just told, don't use vain repetition, right? So here's the thing. If you're saying the same thing over and over without really giving any thought to the, world, to the words or it's void of any engagement of your actual hearts and your minds, then your prayers aren't really going past the ceiling. But... Commentator John Corson says, you know, you can pray these prayers with an engaged heart and a focused mind, and then it can be quite powerful. Only you and God know the difference. There's a difference between meaningless repetition and meaningful repetition, okay? All right, so we see in Luke, in his account, that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. Why did they even know to ask Jesus to teach them to pray? Because what we do know is, well, okay, we don't know, no, no, because they told us that we, if there was every single thing that Christ did written down, the whole world could not contain it all, okay? But we don't really see him holding a lot of big public prayer meetings, okay? Not saying there's anything wrong with that. 
But we're, how did they know to ask him? How did they know that that was important to him? Every gospel talks about Christ got up early in the morning while it was still dark and snuck off to a secret place to pray. We're, we're told in some of the gospels where he went into the wilderness and prayed all night long to his father. He often, as was his habit, went off somewhere to pray in seclusion. You see, Jesus had a God habit. Jesus communed constantly and consistently with the Father. And the world saw the overflow of that personal relationship, that intimate connection of the Father and the Son. Do people see your life and want more of what you have? Do our kids see the fruit and the overflow of our personal time with God that they want some of what we have? Or are we smothering them with our words and not backing it up with action? I fall into that trap a lot because I got a lot of words. And you think I preach here, my poor children, they, <laughs> Tim, yeah, Tim gets probably even more of it because the kids do at some point go to bed. <laughs> He's still there. <laughs> I do a lot of words, a lot of preaching. But are people seeing the fruit of that and desiring whatever it is we've got? So as we go on, verse 16 and 18 says, when you fast, if you're abstaining from food or something in order to give more thought and focus on the Lord and to hear more clearly from him, don't go around complaining about how hard it is, how hungry you are, how weak you are that you can't take a shower because of your spiritual discipline, okay? Right? Don't go around making a scene about it. It's between you and God that's part of your secret private life. And he who sees in secret will reward you in the open. Jesus was setting the stage for us to have an individual interaction with God. I think this is in your bulletin notes as well. He is showing the people and us that the God of the universe wants a personal individual relationship with each and every one of us. Did you hear what I said? Did anybody hear what I said? Are you falling asleep? I know it's hard. It's really hard. It's dark. It's kind of snuggly in here. The God of the universe wants a personal individual intimate, outside of gathered together at church to check it off a list, kind of relationship every single day, every single moment with each and every one of you. Thank you. Wow. That, and that was my husband. That was a miracle. <laughs> Woo! Things are happening. Things are happening. All right. Ooh, now I'm really going. Okay. Christ is giving the key to the secret life of a believer. Don't get me wrong. Church is great. We need church. Hebrews 10 tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We should be in church. We need community. This is when we come together. This is when we build each other up. This is when we sharpen each other and we encourage each other to go out and not forget and not, not do it again until we get back together next Sunday. But to get prepared to walk into every day of our life, fired up, wanting more. Church should be the appetizer for your week. It should not be your main course. Church should be your appetizer for your week. It should not be your main course. If all you have is coming to church once a week, maybe a small group, to check it off a box, then what you have is a very shallow, impersonal faith, and it's not a growing, active walk with the Lord. And you cannot expect the fruits of that to overflow into your everyday life. God wants to walk with us every day, day in, day out, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship. He wants those inside jokes. You know how you have your spouse or your close friend and they know things and not everybody else knows and sometimes you don't even have to really say anything. You just give a look and you both just start laughing because you know exactly where you're going. God wants that kind of relationship with you. He fully knows you. He wants you to get to know him too. And he wants to have those moments. And there's a promise attached to this kind of relationship. Your father who sees in the secret will reward you in the open. There should be some things that are just for the two of you. So go with me here. Just like in marriage, it's the stuff done in private that builds the most intimacy. Everybody tracking with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got that? Everybody's awake now, okay. What are the rewards and the results of those private moments? Well, for one, deeper intimacy, right? You get to know each other a lot better. When you spend that private time with God, there's a deeper intimacy. Don't fear this intimacy. God already knows you, and if you've accepted Christ into your heart, Ephesians tells us that he looks at you and he sees you as blameless. Sometimes we fear getting too close to someone because we don't want them to know all of our badness and all of our mess and all of our mistakes and all the stuff that you can't see when you're out 
right? When we got married, it was a whole eye-opening that I wasn't quite as together as I thought I was because the whole world didn't see the behind the scenes and then Tim was there all the time. So we didn't hit honeymoon phase to about year seven because there was a lot of stuff to get through, right? And sometimes we fear that intimacy because we don't want people to see that so much they won't like what they see. God already knows you fully and loves you completely just as you are. And if you have accepted Christ, when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of himself and he sees you as perfect. So do not fear that intimacy with your heavenly father. Step right into it. What else do we get? That intimate time with the Lord? It's like a resetting of the relationship. Okay, so like the private time in marriage, it's the refresh button. That's what I call it. It's a refresh button. Sometimes we get distracted, we get busy, we get tired. We're all out of sorts. God never moves, but we can get off base, come back to him. Have that one-on-one -on -one time with the lover of your soul. Fruits and blessings. Private, intimate time in marriage produces fruit. And it will be great life-changing rewards that result from the time alone with your heavenly father. A thriving, intentional, personal walk with Christ will result in a rich, blessed life. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that if you go and you read your Bible every day and you remember to pray every day, then you will suddenly get a million dollars. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Rich can mean a lot of things. Maybe God knows that that is what you can properly manage for him and he is gonna throw poor monetary blessings on you so that you can bless others. Sometimes that happens. Somebody's gotta have the money to do the good, right? But peace, strength, Ability to come through hard times and have that unshakable faith. A presence in your home that just reeks of the Spirit of God. These are also blessings that equate to a rich, powerful, full life. These are the kinds of things we find when we do that one-on-one -on -one intimate time with our Lord that strengthens us from the inside out. And then that private time, better relationships with others. So let's be honest. After some behind-closed-doors activities, in marriage, you might be nice with other people. You might have a little more pep in your step. They might notice a glow. In Exodus, we are told that when Moses went up and he was on the mountain and he was communing with God, when he came back down, his face was so bright, he had to wear a veil on his face because the children of Israel could not even look at him. Because people will be able to see when you have spent time with God. They will see it. And you won't even have to say a word sometimes. The chapter just before in Matthew 5, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father. So you think about Exodus and that light that was shining and what they could see. So Jesus is saying, have this secret life with your heavenly father and you will shine. And you won't even have to say anything sometimes. People will be like, I don't know what you got, but I want some. And that opens a door much better than carrying your Bible around and beating somebody over the head. You need some Jesus, right? There's a time and a place for that sometimes. But that intimacy will produce that kind of life. And even if people don't know why, they'll be able to see something else that's different. Your father who sees in secret will reward you in the open. Now this leads me into something I'm very excited about. I call it the brown sugar principle. So first I wanna to read to you Matthew 7 verses one through two. It's about judging others. Turn if you want. I don't even have the scripture or not. It's okay if I don't. Okay, there we go. Now this, again, this is the amplified classic version. So bear with me. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. Verse two, verse two. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. I feel like that's pretty clear. So now we're gonna go on to Ah, love this one. Mark 4, 24. So it's up here in the Amplified. First, I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. Then he added, Jesus, of course, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. 
I love this. I love this promise. I want you to hear this in the Amplified. And he said to them, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear. What's the truth? Word of God, right? So let's not, Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's not get distracted. The more thought and it's a promise in scripture, guys. I put little asterisks in my Bible when I see a promise and I go, ding, 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 promise. It's something I do a lot. And I have an asterisk by every time I find a promise because we can take him at his word. He wants us to, okay? If you find something in the word of God, you take it and you say, God, it says right there and I want it. You said I could. He loves that kind of prayer. He's like, bring it on, sister. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. How much you put into this is how much you're going to get out of this. And then more. More besides will be given to you who hear. All right, I could be on that forever. I got to keep going. All right, next. Well, actually, first I do want to say just show up. Don't tell me, I don't get it. The Bible's too hard. It's confusing. I don't understand it. I try to read it. I don't get anything out of it. I understand. Okay, I understand. But let me tell you that Hebrews tells us the word of God is alive and active. Get into the word and it will get into you. He tells us in Isaiah 55 that his word that he sends out will not return void, but it will accomplish what he sent it out to do. That's his job. Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit would remind us of the things he taught us, but the Holy Spirit cannot remind you of something you have not given mind to. Get in the word let him do the work. Yo hablo español, pero yo estoy obedando muchísimo. I speak Spanish, but I'm forgetting a whole lot of it. But what happened was, I was in class for years, a couple times a week. Does that sound like anything we do a couple times a week? I was in Spanish class for years, every week, a couple, you know, a few hours. I barely scratched the surface, but when I went to Mexico and I lived with a family, when I was immersed and gave continual thought and study to the language, my skills took off like crazy. But it wasn't until I was constantly surrounded by it. So once a week, twice a week, hola, me llamo Jenny, mucho gusto, right? But pero después, muchos, muchos meses allá, yo puedo hablar con una mexicana. I speak like a Mexican sometimes because I spent the time there and it came because I was immersed in it, giving constant thought and study to it. And it was scary at first and it was confusing at first and it was frustrating at first. But then the fruits came. Okay. Now I'm forgetting a lot of it because I'm not spending a lot of time in, in Mexico these days, but there we go. So that tells you what thought and study does. So Luke, Luke 6, 36 and 38. Love this. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. I'm doing this one in the NIV. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Do not judge, you will not be judged. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given back to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And we saw, Mark said, and then more besides. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. Now, I'm not much of a baker, probably because I don't like to be told what to do. I'd rather cook and make it up as I go. Um, just, <laughs> right? The baking and the exactness, it drives me crazy. Um, but I had always, always associated this verse with brown sugar. And it wasn't until a couple years ago that I found out not everybody does that. Does anybody else read this verse and instantly think, oh, brown sugar? Okay, so, <laughs> you know, when you, when you open your mouth, you say something, you thought everybody thought that, and then you're going, Oh, I am weird. So this is what the Lord showed me. If you've ever baked before with brown sugar, what happens? If you're using white sugar, it says what? One cup of sugar. And you get your cup and you level it off. And you got your cup of sugar. Done. But if you're baking with brown sugar, does anybody know what it says? 
one cup of firmly packed brown sugar. So what happens when we get a cup of brown sugar? And this is a good measure, so it probably doesn't even level it off. But then what does it say? Press down. When I press this down, shake it together, press it down, what happens? I got room for more. Put some more in there. Firmly, firmly packed, press down. Look at that. I could still put more on there. And then, not only that, running over, running over and poured into your lap. Our God is not a God of just enough. Our God is a God of more than enough. Did you hear that? He says, you give me some time and I'll bless your socks off. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Our God is a God of more than enough. And I always encourage the kids, be people of more than enough. Don't just put your dish in the sink, put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> get it? We get it? We get where we're going here? Our God is a God of more than enough. Matthew 6, 33, powerful life verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all this other stuff will be added to you besides. Make him your priority. He will do things you never dreamed. Um, I'm going to ask you again, how full is your God pipe? Are you walking around full, stuffed, maxed out, but your God pipe sitting on empty? Ben, if you want to come up and slowly. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Luke 6, 47, 49. For everyone who comes to me and listens to my words in order to heed their teaching. Okay, not... You got to come with intention. Don't just come and listen. You got that done for the week, right? Everyone who, and or read a chapter a day to keep the devil away. I don't care if you're reading through your Bible every year. Are you getting anything out of it? If you're doing it and you're getting stuff, that's awesome. But if you're reading five chapters and walk away and don't have a clue what you just read, who's, do, who, who, who's benefiting from that, right? Everyone who comes and listens to my words in order to heed their teaching and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and went down deep and laid a foundation upon the rock. And when the flood rose and the torrent broke against that house and it couldn't shake it, it couldn't move it because it had been securely built or founded on a rock. But he who merely hears and does not practice doing my words is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation against which the torrent came and burst and immediately it collapsed and it fell and the breaking and the ruin of that house was great. Friends, Christ wants you to be unshakable. Unshakable. Yes, come to church. But if all you're doing is taking what you hear here and you're not taking it into a more deeper personal intimate relationship then it's not going to do you much good be in the word in your private daily unseen life a house can look incredible and beautiful but it's the foundation that is so crucial it's that unseen part that is so crucial it's from that unseen foundation that the entire structure finds the strength to stand come what may. Don't expect your surface, surface Christianity, coming to church, giving to worthy causes, taking a stand on social media. Don't expect your surface Christianity to provide you with the true stability you will need when the storms of life come. You must have a thriving, secret life that is just between you and your creator this is my prayer for you this comes from ephesians it makes me even want to cry just thinking about it if i had to pick a favorite book of the bible it would be ephesians they're all good i love ephesians 
my prayer for you, for all of us. I prayed this prayer for Tim when we were dating. Started in verse 16, I said, God, I fall on my knees. And I pray that he'll be strengthened in his inner man, that he may know the depth and the height and the length of your love for him. And I watched him grow. Amazing. We met and married in seven months, so it was a fast growth. <laughs> but I watched it taking root. And I remember every night on my knees praying this for him. I pray this for myself, for my kids, for this church. We pick up in verse 19, that you may really come to know practically through your experience for yourselves the love of Christ which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience experience is tough sometimes guys experience is not always easy that experience is a pretty word, word a pretty way to say it, tough times but it's through those tough times that you really 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 know the love of Christ that far surpasses mere knowledge unto the fullness of God you may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body holy, filled, and flooded with God himself. Now to him who by and in consequence of the action of the power that is at work, where? Within us. If we've accepted Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of us. Through that power that is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely infinitely beyond our highest prayers desires thoughts hopes or dreams to him be the glory to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen amen so be it so be it our God is not a God of just enough. He is a God of so much more than enough. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. Turn your life completely over to him. Accepting him is important, but it is the beginning. It's really just the beginning. Don't expect to reap the rewards and the benefits of the new covenant. Of the relationship with Christ if you have not committed to do your part now first and foremost it is placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior realizing that it is only you can't do nothing to get yourself perfect okay we can't do anything our God is perfect sin entered the world he can't be united with sin because that would make him no longer perfect and that's not gonna happen he will not change so what's got to happen something's got to change in us but we could never do anything to make ourselves perfect and let me tell you something if you think for one second that anything you can do can get you perfect enough to be united with the mighty god then jesus christ came and died for nothing do you hear that i don't care how you grew up or what you've been taught if you think for one second you can do anything to reunite you in perfection with the perfect heavenly father without the perfect blood sacrifice of jesus christ then you're fooling yourself it is only putting your faith in Jesus and he stands between you and almighty God. And then when he says, why should I be reunited with you? And you say, Jesus, I put my faith in Jesus. And then when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of himself because we are told that Jesus took our sins and gave us his righteousness. So first and foremost, if you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ as your only hope, do that. But then guys, that's just the first step on your journey. A very, very, very important step. But man, then your life can really take off. But not if you don't have that secret life with God. It's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord. It's not enough just to raise your hands in worship and look really holy, but never take it from your lips to your heart. God's not impressed by how holy we look. He knows our hearts in Romans 10, 9 says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Putting your faith in Jesus is the first step, but it's just the beginning to a radical, powerful, supernaturally abundant, overflowing secret life that Christ has for each and every one of us. So how full is your God pipe? It's not too late. You can start filling it up right here and right now by investing in that secret life with the lover of your souls. 
Hey friend, if you enjoyed this episode and you got some good stuff out of it, there's a few options you have. One, you could click that little subscribe button because let's be honest, who's got time to remember to check back and see if there's a new episode, right? So click that subscribe button and then when a new episode comes up, it will just by the magic of the internet pop up in your Dropbox and it'll be right there for you whenever you're ready. And also, if you would review this podcast, Oh my gosh, if you like what you heard, get on there, give it a five-star review. If you didn't like what you heard, just pretend it never happened, okay? (laughs) But if you would do um, a review for me, just take a couple seconds and do that. Not only would I be crazy excited, but also it would just be a great way for us to partner together for you to help this podcast be seen by more women out there. And you could be a part of helping more women discover these practical ways to apply God's word to just everyday stuff. So I would love it, love it, love it if you could help me out in one of those two ways. Mm